Yeah. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to not be up in the bright lights of that main room. Um, so my name is Alex Marsh, and I'm in the Biodiversity Information and Policy Advice Division of Sandby, and specifically in the Ecological Infrastructure Directorate. Um, so most of my work is around uh, natural resource management um, and the sector, looking at the water and the, the water security and biodiversity Jeff Six project, and the research development and innovation platforms that we're doing. And that being said, I'm not talking about any of that today. Um, I am, in the absence of Natasha Wilson, going to speak about the biodiversity and land use project. So what I would like to accomplish today is an overview of what the biodiversity and land use project has been doing over the past two and a half years, uh, specifically speaking to the regulatory tools that they've been working with um, in four different districts. Um, it bears repeating as often as necessary that I'm not an expert in um, much of what I'll be presenting today. Um, I think that Boyd has forgotten more about land use planning than I know, so I will be lobbing all questions directly in that direction. Um, but I can point you in the right direction if you'd like to speak to anybody about the project that I present. So it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour through various components of work, led by Sagwata, Manike, Abigail Kamenev and Natasha Wilson. Um, and to start with what the Biodiversity and Land Use Project is. Um, so it's quite a multi-pronged project that has a very strong capacity development focus that's based within district <coughs> municipalities. And a lot of the work is around the optimization of regulatory tools for improved environmental management. Um, yeah, so those are the districts that we're working in, uh, Western Cape, Eastern Cape, KZN, and Mpumalanga. Um, and just for some more detail about what the project's about, about strengthening cooperation, coordination, and capacity of municipal and other regulatory authorities that regulate land use decisions to incorporate criteria to avoid, prevent, minimize, and or um, minimize offset impact on biodiversity and improve compliance, monitoring, and enforcement. It's quite difficult to make this stuff sound sexy, um, but it is really important for the way that we engage with tools across the country. Um, and then the second component of the work involves bi biodiversity stewardship um, and ecosystem plans. So it started in 2015, closes in 2020, um, and is funded by Jeff. So to get into the detail, um, what we know is that over the past 13, 14 years, we've been working on and into systematic conservation planning. So we, as of this year, we have CBA maps for the entire country. I think the Northern Cape just finished theirs this year. Um, and we've spent a considerable amount of time trying to develop parity and standardization across all of these land use guidelines, all of these plans, and all of these maps. So developing lexicons so that all of our definitions are the same, um, developing keys and colors so that we're all looking at the same stuff across the country. And a lot of effort's also gone into getting these maps um, into IDPs and SDFs. And Spluma, which came into effect in 2015, has brought a lot more force to that. Um, that being said, there's some features that aren't reflected within the CBA maps, uh, specifically around water resources, stuff like estuaries, um, and also the strategic water source areas don't necessarily come across in the maps that we have. So we have all these resources. We have maps, we have land use guidelines, we have biodiversity criteria, and the nuts and bolts of what the Blue Program aims to do is to get these resources into all of the frameworks used by municipalities. So to speak specifically to I think four or five pieces of Seguata's work. In terms of the municipal bylaws, Sandy is recommending that municipalities insert a requirement into their bylaws, indicating that each application must be accompanied by a map of the priority biodiversity areas. So it looks something like that. Um, secondly, the land use zoning schemes, um, and Felicity's going to speak a lot more to this, 
But just to say that SANDI is recommending a hybrid approach where biodiversity priority areas either be zoned for conservation purposes or these areas are included as in an overlay. And what that would mean, looks something like that, what that would mean is that there are extra considerations that the applicant has to take into account when doing any kind of application. And then the municipal planning tribunals, and these were also enabled by SPLUMA and being set up all across the country. And an environmental professional can become a member of the municipal planning tribunals, and in that way they would get to vote on applications. So Sandy is strongly recommending that we enable environmental professionals to join those tribunals so that the environmental voice is there. And then lastly on this piece of work, um, is Sandy recommends that the biodiversity priorities be included as part of the environmental layer of SDFs, um, which means they'll be considered in IDPs. And that there's something like that. And the last thing to say on Saguata's piece of work is around the EI Challenge Fund. Um, Sandy put out a call, I think probably about four months ago, for applications into the Ecological Infrastructure Challenge Fund. Um, and it's focused on projects that enable rehabilitation and restoration of ecological infrastructure. So specifically in Ekhanzeni and Mgungundluvu district municipalities, and the application needs to be done in collaboration with the municipality that the piece of work would be done in. Um, so one of the goals of the project is for EI-related projects to be normalized into IDPs. So it has to be a partnership and there is a co-funding component to it. It also would have to be on municipal or communal land, so not private land, um, and include water, disaster risk reduction, and so we've awarded one project so far, which is around the Ngeni wastewater treatment, mm -hmm. and we're still looking to award about four, and each of them are about a million rand in value. So the call is still open, and if you have any ideas, please contact Zaguata. Okay, so briefly to move on to the second part of component one, which is led by Abigail, um, around environmental management. And I'm only going to speak to two pieces of her work. And the first is around strategic water source areas. So when the project started, um, there was a range of work being done through various institutions. Um, CSIR and WRC were working on maps. Uh, WWF and CER were doing legal studies. And we saw the opportunity to pilot the listing of a subset of strategic water source areas as prohibition areas under NEMA 242A. So that work began about a year and a half ago, and they've developed a bunch of reference groups, technical working groups, uh, TORs for service providers on technical reports. They've also identified three draft areas where they want this work to be done. And so I think that this project is kind of right in the midst of working out how it will work. Um, so that's definitely a space to watch. It's very innovative. Um, and there are some partners who are very excited about it. And the last thing to say about Abigail's work is on the DS screening tool. Um, and this is perhaps the one I've been furthest away from. Um, but just to say that it's a pre-application tool that's going to be online. It's going to be launched for people to start playing with in December and go live kind of nationally by March of next year. Um, so it's a web-enabled application for pre-application so that people can enter more fully into the mitigation hierarchy and also identify the environmental sensitivities that they want to avoid through their EIA process. So Sandy developed the biodiversity inputs for the screening tool. Um, the objectives is to give more environmental information in EIA processes um, and be able to identify the sensitive areas more effectively. So currently it looks like that. It is set up. You can go and play around with the functionality. Um, and uh, so you put various layers to find sensitivities. It generates a report. 
that you will eventually need to include on EIAs. So any more information, um, to please speak to Abigail. She'd be more than happy to engage on helping people to engage with the screening tool specifically. Um, and then the last thing to talk about today is component two, conservation and sustainable use of uh, biodiversity on private and communal lands. And this is the piece of work that's been led by Natasha Wilson um, and that I'm holding in her, her absence um, because she's currently holding a newborn baby. So, the work program around biodiversity stewardship has been very busy over the past few months um, because we had the first national biodiversity stewardship conference um, about five weeks ago. So, there is a set of resolutions that came out of that conference that has since gone to Working Group 1, the CEO's forum, and MinTech and been adopted and recommended for implementation. And the next step for us is to figure out how to give full effect to those resolutions. Um, the other thing that is ongoing right now is a biodiversity guideline, which should be out in the first quarter of next year. Um, we're doing a series of capacity building events with conservation outcomes, the first of which is happening the end of this month, um, and another one's happening in February. Um, and the other thing that we're doing right now is around the business case, which was developed in 2015, which generated estimates of what it would cost to effectively resource biodiversity stewardship in provincial authorities across the country. And the estimate was 9 million rand, and that's changed over the years. So the TOR that's going to be going out early next year is going to be about ground truthing that number to figure out actually what it would mean in real terms. Um, and also to do an institutional scoping process um, because the barriers and challenges to declaring sites uh, as protected areas are different in different provinces and we need to understand how to work best into that. And then the last slide is around biodiversity management um, plans for ecosystems uh, Sandy is currently looking for a service provider who would like to pilot one of these plans over the next two years. So if you're interested, it would have to be in one of our districts, but if you're interested in that kind of work, please do be in touch with me. And the last thing to say is around financing mechanisms. Um, there's a lot of talk, I mean, we just had a session about biodiversity finance, and there's a lot of talk right now about how to effectively resource what we're doing. So you can expect quite a few national dialogues over the next year around that. Um, and Candace Stevens from BirdLife has done some really innovative work around income tax uh, with Treasury. So that's also ongoing, and the work that she's done to date has opened some more doors. So if you'd like to know more about any stewardship stuff, please do get in touch with me. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thanks to all of our partners. <laughs>